There's definitely a lot to learn when it comes to living in a van, but at the end of the day, it all comes down to just common sense and doing the right thing for you. What you hear and learn on my channel or another YouTube channel may not be how you want to live your life or some of the products that I have may not be right for you. And that's the great thing about van life is I truly honestly feel that it's just a life experiment that you're going to have to figure out on your own. And sometimes you may learn some things that I didn't and you may be able to pass that knowledge along to somebody else. So today is a bit of a long video about winter van life. I put some air in my tires this morning because uh, I was a little mushy out there yesterday in the snow and I just didn't feel like I had the traction. Oh, <laughs> this ditch is definitely way more full of water than it was yesterday. These old wood decks that are way out here in the backcountry can be pretty slippery sometimes, especially with a uh, with a coat of snow on it. It's not really that cold out this morning, so it's not very icy. Oh. All right. It's a big power dam over here. All this water you guys see coming through the dam is actually coming from a creek up there, those tubes they've capped the creek off and the creek comes through the tubes and then down through here. Does that ever look awesome in the morning? Oh wow. I love it. But how cool is that? Right there, a little creek in the tube. One of my favorite things on the planet right now is this Sputters hash browns. They're amazing. They got bacon in it and all the pre-cut little peppers and stuff. Like, look at this thing. Oh, amazing. Yeah, pretty little waterfall. Just needed some water to do some dishes. When it comes to looking for knowledge about winter van life online, it can be a really, really hard. Because a lot of people out there have really strong opinions on certain heaters or certain insulations that are the best. I myself don't think that there's one answer to everything. I think there's a heater for every different financial bracket and every different situation and different stages in life. I think that there's a different insulation for each individual person that none of them are exactly the perfect answer. So today we're just going to talk. We're going to stand here by this beautiful river and just have a conversation about winter van life. That snow line up there sure has come down in the last couple of days. Look at that. It's like right there that's a big mountain too so because we ran into snow yesterday i figured well what's a perfect time to uh to talk about van life in the winter and some things that you need to consider and maybe some things that you just haven't thought of i got my i got my nice little winter gloves on <laughs> what's wrong with that finger <laughs> there we go <sighs> What's up, weirdos? <laughs> okay, so now that the weather is getting cooler, some of you may be thinking, oh no, what do these people in vans do when it's winter time? How do they stay warm? We turn the heater on. Let's start this video off with saying there's two seasons that are of concern in van life. Fall and spring, cakewalk. Weather is perfect for sleeping in the van. And then the two other ones that come up are hot summer days and cold winter nights. I don't know what it's like to be living in a place that has winter for five months out of the year. I'm on the west coast of Canada. So out here, our winters are extremely short and very, very mild. Wet, 
but mild in temperature. We may see minus five, minus six, but that's about it for about a week. But as you move over one more province over in Canada or go north in British Columbia, now you're getting into places that see winter, see minus 20 and minus 30 for long periods of time. Um, that's why in Vancouver we see a huge influx of van lifers from all the provinces in Canada. They come down this way if they're not going south for the winter like all the snowbirds are. They come here because we're pretty mild, wet but mild. I think we've associated that, that it's very moist out here. I said moist. <laughs> it's true, look at, look around. Ah, but it's all the rain here on the west coast that keeps this part of BC looking this amazing. Anyway, I'm getting off track promoting British Columbia uh, tourism BC. We, we, we should talk, you guys, because I take the... Call me, okay? <laughs> okay, wintertime. There is multiple different types of heating sources that you can use in your van. You can rock it with no heater and go somewhere warm or you can rock it with a 12 volt little blanket and I hear that actually works pretty good. I've never tried it myself. Or there's multiple different types of heaters. I started my van life with the Mr. Buddy heater. You screw in the little one pound propane bottle and sure it warmed the van up, but it was kind of a bit of a, like a damp camping sort of moisture. Like things never quite felt like dry and comfortable. And I didn't know any better because that's what I started with. Hear that noise? Here comes the grater. <laughs> Things are about to get noisy real quick. And uh, after that, I upgraded to the Olympian Wave 3. The Olympian series, the Olympian Wave series heaters are incredibly awesome for van life. And if you're starting off on a budget, I think that's probably your best starter propane option. Mr. Buddies are about a hundred bucks here. Olympian Waves 3, which is the one I started with, was 350 bucks here in Canada. And then now I'm using the Wabasto dry air heater, which after install was $2,500. Very expensive. Just waiting for that grater to go by. <laughs> I've waved at the grater guy like four times and he just like, off he goes. <laughs> no matter how crazy I'm waving, he's just like, what's wrong with this guy? There's gonna be pros and cons to any kind of heater that you use. Obviously, if you're running a propane heater, you have the internal combustion, I think that's the word for it, that's a problem. So with a propane one, um, most propane ones, not all of them, they use the air inside of your living space to create heat, which means it's burning your oxygen in order to keep that flame going to keep it heated. And the problem with that is, is you need that oxygen. You're in a smaller confined space. And if you don't have a ton of open windows and a ton of ventilation, you may not wake up in the morning. And I don't know about you, but that's just something I don't plan on doing when I go to bed at night. I plan on getting a restful night's sleep. I don't plan on resting for the rest of my life, you know? But I understand, like me, I started off completely busted, broken van life, and the buddy is what I could afford, so that's what I started with. And I never had a roof vent when I started. I cracked my side windows open. I mean, we survived through it, but that's also a thing that you need to be super, super cautious about. And that's using a heat source that actually, I just got a water drop in my ear. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Tree. Uh, be super cautious about the heat choice that you use. Then the Olympian Wave 3 is really good. It still uses internal air to combust the, the thing, but it's different. It's not like, I felt like the, the Olympian one wasn't like producing tons of moisture. Like there was no actual open flame on it. It's like some reaction in the front mat. I'm not sure how that all works. You'll have to Google it. Um, but yeah, there's pros and cons to absolutely everything. They do make like little mini fireplaces. We're still talking propane here. We're not talking about about um, wood stoves yet. So they make these little ones. They're like Dickinson, I think they're called Dickinson. They're like a little marine. You can see the flame inside of it. You open up the little grate, you light the propane and you can see the flame, you shut it. Looks like a little mini shiny wood stove, sort of. So that one there, because it's it, you, you have to cut a hole in the outside, it pulls air from the outside. 
to, so it combusts the outside air, not your inside living space air, and then it chimneys out the roof. So there's a bit more of an install when it comes to those ones, but they are really, really cool. Kind of gives you that wood stovey feel without having the need to stock your wood stove every few hours. So that brings us to, actually, let's talk about my heater first. I chose to go with the Wabasto gasoline heater. Sure, it was super, super expensive, but now I don't have to fuss with filling up a 10 liter little portable diesel tank all the time or carrying an extra container of fuel in my van. I have a gasoline van and I chose to just go right out the gate and spend big money and get a good heater for my home that taps to my gasoline tank. So now I just top fuel up in my van like I was going on an adventure like I always do and as long as my gas tank has at least a quarter of a tank of fuel in it I have heat once my gas tank gets down to about a quarter tank that's where the fuel line for my heater stops so when you're running your heater in the backcountry there's no way for you to use all your gasoline in your gas tank just to heat it it has it only taps part way through the tank, not right to the bottom. There's also the the knockoff ones you find on on, um, on Amazon and stuff, like $250 little knockoff diesel heaters. I've heard really great things about them. I know I have friends that have them that freaking love them. And I've also have friends in my life who've had nothing but problems and problems and problems with them. So, you know, it's a good start. No matter where you wanna go, where you wanna start, it's your own choice at that matter. Just really think that situation through. And there's nothing wrong with not wanting to buy the expensive one like me and buying the knockoff version one. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. They're kind of all the same thing anyway. Um, but do your own research on heat and also consider the temperatures that are in your area. My advice to you on heat might be completely wrong if you're living way up in the northern side of BC or you're on the other side of Canada or in the middle of it where it's like <laughs> for five, six, seven months out of the year, I may not be the one to give you the right advice for that. Try to find people that are van lifing in your area and take advice from them. Uh, different types of heat sources have their pros and cons. Just do your research on the one that you want to buy. And obviously finances come into a major play when it comes to choosing the heater. So just choose the best one in your little financial zone there. So if you can afford a $100 buddy heater, you may want to consider saving up a little bit earlier in the year, like maybe start saving in the fall for your winter heater and maybe try to put $300 into it because at $300, you could buy yourself an Olympian Wave 3 if you choose propane or you could buy yourself one of those knockoff diesel ones on Amazon for what, 250 bucks or something like that Canadian. It's probably way cheaper in the US, I know that's for sure. Winter time is the time of year where you need to pack more blankets or more little throw blankets to go on top. Sometimes, I've done this in the past, where I'll buy a blanket for 40 bucks from Ikea for the winter. And then once winter is done, because I don't have a place to always store something big like that, I will just donate that to the Salvation Army or something like that and you know whatever or maybe I'll pull up to some homeless guy somewhere that seems cold after the winter time for me and I'm, I'm doing good I'll just go donate my blanket somewhere else so I have done that in the past where I buy one for the winter and then get rid of it for the summer months at that point $40 to keep yourself a little extra warm in the winter is really no big deal because um, when you're living in a small space having all this like extra stuff like you're you know, like like your mom or your grandma, or I don't know why I'm picking on the girls with this one, but keep boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of seasonal stuff. Like my mom had like stacks of things that said Christmas, 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 come on. But you know, we, living in a confined space like the van, we don't have that kind of option, but blankets are key. I know people that use the 12 volt Heated blankets, they say they're really good. I've never used them, but that's another one. Keep in mind, whatever you're heating for in your van, um, ventilation is key because moisture builds up very quickly when you have cold, wet on the outside or just cold on the outside and hot inside. 
there's always, you're in a tin can, so there's gonna be sweating on either side of it no matter what's happening. So if it's cold outside and hot inside, guaranteed you're gonna get condensation on the inside of your walls or on your windows, on your roof, wherever it is. There is no way to fight that. It's just natural, it's science, it's just what happens. But you can do as many preventative measure, measures as you can to keep it at bay. Ventilation is key. I have a roof vent in my van. It's a Max Air. It's open all year round. I very, very rarely shut that thing. It's open, it's not on, but it's open. So there's always that steady flow of air. When it's windy outside, you can hear the wind and stuff coming through it. I just leave it open because there's no real reason to shut it. Snow doesn't get in it, rain doesn't get in it. It's good to go. It's just the way the, the vent is because it's got that little hood on the top. I don't know if you've seen a Max Air. It's got the hood so nothing can get underneath, right? At least I haven't had anyway. The only time I do shut it is if I happen to be in a minus 20 or something like that where it's super cold and I'm trying to hold as much as my, as much as my heater heat in my van as I can then I will shut it for the night, but I usually crack it back open during the day. But ventilation and having some kind of an air movement in there really, really, really helps with moisture. Um, getting like moisture on the inside of your front windows, I don't care about that. I don't care if I get up in the morning and you can't see out my front windows. I don't care what other people think. If I'm sleeping on the side of a street in a residential neighborhood and my front windows are foggy, it doesn't matter to me. That's one that is a really hard one to fight but I know a lot of people that get into van life from the beginning, they're like, oh no, people are gonna know I'm in here, my windows are foggy. Sometimes it's better that people know you're in it than to know that you're just, it's just an empty van sitting there and a little thief's like, I'm gonna break in. So for me, I enjoy having the fact that people know I live in it. I like my van that it doesn't look stealthy. It looks like a camper van. And uh, so yeah, I wouldn't really worry too much about the condensation on your front windows. It is what it is. There's no insulation on those windows. They're 100% exposed to cold on the outside, heat on the inside. Just keep windows open, find roof fence, maybe get a window, keep it cracked, something to keep some airflow in there. Another great piece of advice that I learned over the years is get a circulating fan in the winter. That's something you think about in the summer to have a fan to blow air on you, but in the winter time, that is a great way to move some of that hot air around. Because most heaters will heat one area. Like my heater is pointed towards the front of the van because it's under my bed. It's not pointed backwards, which would be ideal, but I didn't have a space to install it that way. So having the fan in the front allows the heat to go in and rise. The fan up here blows it to the back of the van and kind of makes it with like, you know, it cuts down on the little cool spots in the van because my back of my van by default is just cooler. And I don't mind that at all, that it's warmer in the front, cooler in the back, but that fan definitely does help to even, even it out a little bit. Um, another thing for moisture too, in the winter time, I guess I can't say winter, there's certain times of the year where the underside of your bed is more prone to moisture. And usually I find it's at this time of the year when you're just shifting into the cooler winter season, you're hot, your mattress is cool, and because of the little two temperature things there, you'll get moisture underneath your mattress. It's not an all year round thing, it's usually this time of year. Um, I put a product underneath it called Hypervent. It's just a, like a hard rigid, looks like spaghetti wound together. It's uh, underneath there, it just keeps my mattress off the wood, allowing airflow to get through there. And honestly, it has worked. I will let you know how things go as we get deeper into winter with it this year, because sometimes when you repair a problem, I had moisture, I bought the hypervent, it went underneath there, it stopped. But sometimes when you make those changes, it would have maybe just stopped anyway because it was like a week, two weeks later, maybe it was just out of that time where, where that sweating thing was a problem underneath my mattress. So I will let you know this year how good that product is. But so far, I've had no moisture whatsoever since I put it in. Another thing you're gonna face in the winter time is uh, parking. 
if you're in an area like Ontario or something like that, or even any of the provinces in between here in Canada or in snowy places in the countries that you're living in, is parking on the side of a street in a town that has heavy snow removal is very difficult. I learned this on my first trip to Ontario. Um, I was out there pretty late in the year and all these snow signs started to pop up that there was no street parking. I pulled up beside a big apartment building like that's my normal thing when I'm in a city right in front of an, uh, an apartment. There was all these signs saying, sorry, no parking, snow removal. I'm like, oh crap. So I started to drive through the neighborhoods trying to find my usual places to park and there wasn't any because there were snow removal streets. You can't park on the streets in, in some of those cities. So that's another thing to think about is it's going to restrict the places that you can normally camp out in if you're in a town that uh, definitely gets winter. I don't know if you guys have have, uh, have had those scenarios, but, but sometimes in the winter time, you may have to change your mindset on where you normally make home. So your typical typical places that you would camp out in may change in the winter months. Insulation, man, we could talk about, we can make a whole video just about insulation. So I am no expert, but much like heating your van, there is pros and cons to every type of insulation that you choose. I myself have just basic white styrofoam on the roof. It's got like a green plastic on one side, a foil on the other, and it's just white styrofoam. That's all I have on my ceiling in the van because that's what I could afford at the time. It was $14 for a four by eight sheet. And because I was broke, that's what I did. Did it work? Yes. On my walls, all I have is one, just one, well, two in some spots, but one half inch layer of pink rigid foam board. I think it's called XPS or something like that. And it's not fully top to bottom covered. It's only on the bare sheet metal. So in the inside of a van, once you gut it, or if you have a cargo van, you can see it. There's the areas where the windows would be. That's bare sheet metal. That's the same metal that's on the outside. And then you have all this, this like support stuff going around it just for support. Well, I only have the bare sheet metal pieces covered. All the little ridges that are in there are completely exposed completely so i went through and lived in my van for the first winter with just insulation well tow truck driver's coming back he ain't coming to pick me up <laughs> how you doing sir i am i'm making a video right now i'm like that tow truck driver ain't coming back for me Idea? Uh, yeah. Nice. Let me get you some stickers. Hey, man. I'm doing good, man. I made a video about <laughs> subscribers. They're kind of everywhere. <laughs> okay, so uh, I don't know what I was talking about. Insulation. I think. <laughs> I think it was insulation. So I only have the bare metal pieces covered in my van, and I know a lot of people fully cover in everything. And I personally think that you don't want to fully seal off between your inside and the metal in the van. The reason why I say not to fully completely seal it right off is because if moisture does get in there, you need to have a place for that moisture to escape. You need to have some kind of an airflow back there and not seal everything completely right off because science guys there's there's gonna be a moisture between the two heat sources a hundred percent inside hot outside cold always gonna have some kind of moisture so you need to have a way for that moisture to escape because it's inevitable it's gonna start you can see down the inside of my walls and there's lots of airflow from the top and the sides you just got to keep ways for that air to get in there and move around a little bit but I didn't hyper insulate my vehicle because I lived in it seeing all the insulation. I could see what was going on. I could see if there was moisture and if there wasn't and if the insulation worked or didn't work. 
So because I started broke, I had the luxury, weird to say that, started broke living in an empty van, I had the luxury to see what was happening on my walls through one entire winter using the Buddy Heater and the Olympian Wave 3 heater before we put up walls. And that's another thing. Once you start putting up walls and then cabinets and things, all those things add insulation as well. So the insulation itself is, is only one part of what keeps you warm inside the vehicle. Once I threw up that quarter inch sheet of pretty wood, it got warmer, you know? So whatever type of insulation you choose to use is completely up to you. There's things like Havelock wool, you can use hemp, there's Thinsulate, you can do spray foam. There's so many different options, but everything has its pros and has its cons. So find out what what um, what feels right for you. So Ray Outfitted, the company that I've been working with for, for, for quite a while for some things in my van, Ray Outfitted once said, and I think this was such, a, it was beautifully said, and I think they heard it from somebody else. The best insulation to use is insulation that's installed. You could sit there and you could fuss about what kind to use for forever. But the best insulation is the one you actually put in, whatever it is. If it's installed, it'll work. <laughs> all right? So yeah, that's about all I got for the insulation part. One thing I do know about spray foam is I've seen so many sprinter vans and transit vans drive by and the tops are all warped and buckled because once that spray foam is in there, it can expand. So if it gets in behind any of that support ribbing, it can buckle the outside. And another thing that I heard too, which is probably why I would never insulate anything that's metal. If uh, my ambulance may be, I may spray foam the ambulance because it's fiberglass. But if you ever get into an accident in your van and it's fully spray foamed over the metal, if you need to weld any body panels on, you have a big problem. At that point, you're gonna have to take your whole inside of the build, rip your build out, which is a pain, cut out all of that spray foam around the metal that needs to be welded because they can't weld with the foam behind it because you're gonna have a fire. So that's just something to think about if you're gonna go that spray foam route is the repairability down the line and how much of a pain that's gonna be. Right now with mine, they could cut out the outside, reach up, pull out any insulation that I have, no big deal because nothing is really stuck to the metal. It's just kind of there with spray glue. So last two things about van lifing in the winter, especially if you're traveling, if you're just sticking around a town that has a lot of great snow removal, you're okay. But if you're traveling, you need to find out what the travel restrictions are for driving with or without snow tires. And if you do require chains in order to be in those areas. I know on the mountain passes here in BC, it has the great big sign and it's the law you have to have snow tires to take the mountain pass or you have to have chains on hand and there's sections there that says you must chain up you got to pull over put the chains on drive through the pass and then you can take them off afterwards but you need to find out what the travel laws are in those areas during the winter season i myself have winter rated tires on my van that meet the criteria that's on that sign i think it's the three peak winter rated tires and my bf goodrich ko2s are definitely those the logo is right there on the side to tell me so. Um, another great thing too is keep yourself um, with a satellite messaging unit because you never know when you're traveling somewhere and you're on a high mountain pass, it's a late night or something like that and uh, you get stuck in the snow and you're not quite ready for it because things like this happened yesterday where you head out to the valley and bam, <laughs> you hit the snow. Having some kind of a satellite texting unit is always great to have while you're living in a van especially if you're exploring down these backcountry roads at all and there's all sorts of different ones i have the garmin in reach but guys that's just a good idea if you have any other questions about winter van life anything at all please let me know in the comments of this video and i'll try to throw it in a q a video coming up but i think this just about covers it winters are way better than living in a van on a hot summer day Hands down, it's easier to stay warm, just click the heater on, it's comfy cozy, than it is to run an air conditioning unit in the summertime because most van lifers don't have the luxury of having enough power in your vehicle to run an air conditioning unit.
that is uh that's uh that's some luxury all right guys thanks for watching hopefully you guys enjoyed the travels out here in the squamish valley um yeah <laughs> oh so good anyway guys i had a great day <laughs> my notes are i got notes here <laughs> they're all wet now thanks for watching you guys we'll see you soon it's easy before you get going living out here on the road whether it's on a big overland adventure or you're van lifing full time like me it's pretty easy to talk yourself into a frenzy like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do when it gets cold? It's gonna be so hard. And you end up saying so many negative things to yourself that you talk yourself out of it. Honestly, guys, get out here and learn. At the end of the day, it's gonna be one heck of a life experience. Okay, we're done. See you soon. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna need this. <laughs> See ya.